Hey everybody, this is Derek Gilman and welcome to High Rollers. Today's guest is the creator of Port Royal. He's the founder of Wonderland Nurseries and he's the co-founder of the Gangier. I am thrilled to welcome Kevin Jodry into the High Rollers Lounge today. Thank you for having me, Derek. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you, Kev. One of the reasons I brought you on here today, one of the things that just I kind of really get excited about, even though you've got so many fun projects in the mix, um, is the genetics. The passion you have for hunting out the strains, for resurrecting old varieties. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about this passion of yours and kind of like where it began. Totally. Um, my background in cannabis was, was initially through looking at cannabis that was coming off of huge supply boats coming into New England. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate as a young kid, you know, 11, 12, to be able to see all these different varietals. And what was going on was as the earth harvested cannabis, seasonal, it was all outdoor at that time, this would have been the 70s, no indoor production anywhere at that time. Um, the varieties would come into New England and we, would able, we were able to see those, those origin strains coming through. So we would see Colombian that would come through. Real Thai always came in around September. We always got the real Afghani hash around, you know, uh, November, December. And so I had this beginning of cannabis where I was able to really take a look at all these individualized varietals that were separated by thousands of miles. So there really was very little hybridization globally. Sure. But I was able to see all these different varieties in it, and I was able to experience them. And I, I think I knew where they were coming from because the level of product that we were looking at was large. And the people that I was dealing with at that time, family members and other people, were very connected. So it was pretty clear what we were, what we were seeing and doing. And it was just such a, a beautiful time period because you would, you would go through the cycle seasonally of all these incredible varieties. What is this, the late 70s? Yeah, late 70s, early 80s. Okay. By 83, basically it changed completely. 83 was when they, they had blockaded the oceans. No more cannabis was really coming in domestically. 83 was the first year that I started to see indoor from Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania, they were punching indoor out in Pennsylvania in the 80s and it was being shipped into New England. Um, the price, when the prices changed, it went from 70 an ounce for Colombian gold up to 200 an ounce for this product. And it started the, the change in what we know. And the first, the first cannabis we grew was, 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 a, it was, must have been some kind of like South African variety because we knew it was coming over from that area, but it wasn't long cycle strains. And that was the first cannabis I grew probably, you know, 79, 80. And this is back east? Yeah, back east of my grandmother's garden. Outdoors? Yeah, outdoor. Get out of here. Yeah, yeah, and we did it outdoor and they finished around, you know, Halloweenish in New England, which was in that year that we did it, the frost hadn't come in so heavy and so that we were able to finish. And it, it, it was an incredible experience to be able to see the cannabis that you grew and then try to compare it to the cannabis that it came from. And that's when I started to really understand input because I knew that the seeds that we were growing were directly from the flower we had smoked, but our flower had similar uh, flavonoid profiles, but different because we were using New England soil, New England biology, New England air, so the toa of our area had a distinct input on the cannabis compared to where we had re received it from. Can you tell me, was there a certain variety that to this day you were like, oh man, oh, something totally. that just is, is, brings back the nostalgia for yeah. you? Yeah. Which one? Which one oh was my it? gosh, I, I had a love affair with really, with, with high quality Afghanis because they were these dusty, clumpy, um, they didn't have the visual appeal that people, people see them today because of the, the amount of travel to get it here. But they were so acrid and it was like burning a tire. When you lit it on fire, it was like the smoke would come off and just hold and you could move the smoke around and it would still float in the air. It was just so oily and rich. I remember that for sure. And it was, it was just so pure in its effect. And I really loved the Colombians and I had a, a love affair with some of the really good Thai, the, the, the true chocolate Thai and a very small amount of cannabis gave you an incredible input. That stuff didn't have much of a ceiling either. Like, no, like the more you smoked, the more you could lift up. And, and it was kind of scary too, because when you're younger, you're like, wow, I'm really lit up. <laughs> now you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that burnt rubber smell mm -hmm. just a minute ago and so i have to ask you because what i think of when i think of that aroma 
is the old school skunk. Yes, yes. And I and happen to know that you've been working on something, right? I am, I'm digging in the skunk project. And burnt rubber isn't burning rubber with a torch. It's the smell of your sneaker that you stopped your bike with. So when you were a kid riding your bike and you ground your feet on the ground. <laughs> Dragging them, yeah. That smell <laughs> is exactly what I liked so much in skunks. And that old skunk, it's been gone. It somehow along the way, it got lost. Once we started to take uh, cannabis and put it into clonal form and not hold it in seed form, once you lost the clone, you lost the entire line. And so I've lost a couple of libraries in the past due to a uh, variety of reasons, raids, yeah. robberies. But we weren't doing, we, 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 we didn't know enough. You weren't quite aware of the scarcity of these things. That's an education we learned as we went forward. We thought that it was going to continue to be present. We thought that if you had Afghani in Afghanistan, then you'd always be able to get it. Even, you may not be able to get it across from a boat, but you'd be able to access the genetic material. Sure. And what we learned is that's not true. And all those home of origins, war, financial considerations, took away the populations. And we weren't holding it in seed form enough to where we, we could go back into it. So once you lost the clone, you lost the tone. And you're working on bringing this skunk back. I'm, I'm working on bringing it back. And mostly because skunk was one of the varieties that was, rem and this is an opinion, but it was removed from the system not because it wasn't attractive, but because it was too highly recognizable through scent. So you're saying it was because this, that the skunk was such a beacon, that its, that its, that its aroma was such a beacon to law enforcement yes. or thieves or whomever, that it was the indoor growers that ultimately had to kind of start adjusting. Yes, because after 83, and you started, like, especially in Humboldt, 83 began the camp era, everything went indoor. The hydroponic industry explodes at that moment to work with it the rest of the United States recognizes that they can grow also indoor. And lo and behold, you have this indoor revolution. Well, that indoor revolution, the problem was, you know, you're growing cannabis on, on a semi-commercial level in a neighborhood where prior it was growing up in the mountains, so it didn't matter if it smelled. But once you put it inside a neighborhood, the smell of those skunk varieties was so penetrating and it was so, when you're talking about theols and esters, they're ultra volatile. And so they move through the room like you can't believe. What'd someone tell me? It was like a fart in an elevator. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's a pretty good description. It moves. And the whole neighborhood would know. Yes, the whole neighborhood would know. And at that time, it was too risky to take, to take this type of risk. And I was somebody who was, was building operations at that time. And I started going through populations and finding cultivars that had less distinguishable smells. Mm. Because with, otherwise, you couldn't cultivate. So I held the aromatic varieties in my library but we were producing and for the operations I ran and for other people that were doing the same thing, you started to see a change in the scent profiles of cannabis to become less recognizable. So to me, most cannabis goes through hot periods where it's desirable and then it kind of goes out of vogue. But skunk was one where it never went out of vogue. It went out of vogue because it was too much penalty to grow it. And for me, it was something that I wanted to see if I could bring back. Could I go back in time and find plants from the early 80s that had these characteristics in female form and then go back into them and start to dig through these genetic Now, is this materials? stuff that you had maintained in your library? Where did you, how did you go about, you know, Digging rediscovering? And I got pretty lucky in the sense that um, I had a connection in Europe that had a, a, an 88 skunk that was unbelievable. And then I was really lucky in that uh, Lawrence Ringo, who was a friend of mine, Lawrence was a collector too, and he had a skunk from Salmon Creek that was from the 81. So how, and so you go and you start regenerating. This. I start to regenerate these. And so I have this beautiful aromatic floral skunk that was stunning. And then I have the burnt fuel rubber skunk that's stunning. And so then I was- You're talking to, sexy talk now. Oh yeah, it was gorgeous. You know, rich penetrating smells, exceptionally positive uplifting effect. When you come off the skunk, it's not a, an ab abrupt drop. Nice. So you glide, Smooth you glide out of the high. And well, the words indica and sativa, they get used uh, so differently now because um, how people want to classify cannabis. So now we're saying, you know, wide leaf blood, you know, drug cultivar, narrow leaf drug cultivar, but we're just going to call it the indica and sativa for today. Sure. The indica varieties that were hybridized gave you the bottom end, gives you the body effect. And too much of it makes you lethargic. 
These were the, the couch lock. Exactly. And then with the, the sativas, you had too much cerebral, you get racy, paranoia. These, these are the people that are a little bit sensitive, the ones that start, yeah, like you said, yeah, they're paranoid, they get anxious, they they're looking out, the yes. <laughs> looking out the window. They're looking out the window. Yes. Looking out the window. So when you combine a hybrid like that, not only for production purposes do you do better because you're, you know, you're taking dissimilar gene pools and combining them, so it's giving you a hybrid vigor potential, but you're also combining the effects. Beautiful bottom end so that you feel relaxed, but you're awake. And those are the things that I'm trying to dig back into because all of that cannabis that was pooled at that time was from gene pools that had been selected for centuries. So the Afghanis that went into that had been selected for centuries, so too the Mexicans, so too the Colombian side. That, a lot of that, a lot of those, you know, land races we yeah. call them, but they were they were the selected cultivars from those from those cannabis producing mm -hmm. regions. A lot of that stuff through the mid and late seventies. That's the stuff people were smoking. They were going to concerts. They're going to comedy shows. They're they're smoking it out at parties. Mm -hmm. This was you know it was cerebral. It was energizing, but not so much so that people were you know getting that you know anxiety and the paranoid. But they also weren't getting that crash. But what people don't I think they realize is that the people who were growing cannabis and shipping it to the U.S. It wasn't just commercial cannabis. I mean, they were making money on it, but it was really families that had been cultivating for centuries. And so they were choosing it for qualities of effect. Now we go off of a lot of other criteria, appearance primarily, but they were working off of effect. Does it do what it's supposed to do? And I think that, that when people were smoking back in the 70s, they wanted these positive effects. They wanted to really experience it. And I think that society at that time was a little bit more uplifted in terms of how they perceive things. And as the world moves quicker, we start to feel overwhelmed. And if we increase the, the cerebral nature, it makes you feel even more overwhelmed. And so you started to see a change in distributions and how much more of a sedative type cannabis came in. So what I'm trying to do is get into this, you know, 80-20, 80, 80 on the sativa side, 20 on the indica side, so that I have a base but I'm not lethargic because when you come off of a heavy indica, you're tired. You get that crash. You crash. And with the cerebral sativas, you don't. You have this beautiful landing, but the body effect is wonderful because I notice as I get older, I'm sore. Just, you know, knee hurts a little so bit. You still but, need some of that yeah, body, yeah. but it's about finding that right balance. Exactly. These 80-20s. And, 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 and how do we determine the 80-20? By perception. People believe that when you extract, all you do is take the good stuff. But you leave things too. An extract concentrates and it removes. And so what you do is you take this balanced whole plant and you pull from it, but what did you leave? And everyone goes, well, you left the plant material. But we don't really understand how a lot of this inter interacts. And so as we start to use concentrates, we go, hey, that is not the same balanced effect that I get from flour. And then when you consume it, concentrates are always very loud. A lot of it now because they're adding terpenes to it. Mm -hmm. But it's because it's concentrated. But the effect is not stable. It tends to be, the concentrates in my experience tend to be very up, okay? Aggressive. But, but not, not so much body. It no, seems a no. lot of the body kind of gets, gets, gets lost in out. In my experience at least. And these delicate bonds in theols and esters, they're so delicate that they don't come off in extract form. And so when you run them through a stack and you pull the BHO off or you pull the CO2 off, you've lost that. What I love, Kevin, is you know that you know this stuff, but you know the science behind it as well. Well, I'm but lucky. The, I'm lucky that I get to talk to really, you know, same thing. <laughs> we get really good people to talk to, so it helps us. Yeah. Man. Um, but the bottom line is, what I'm hearing mm -hmm. is that there's certain aromas and flavor and flavor profiles that you can get in the flower form that you can't get any other way because of the very nature of these chemical reactions that occur that can get lost through some of the processes, extractions, whatever manufacturing, handling it goes through. Yes. And it sounds like your preferred method of consumption is uh, the flour. Mm -hmm. And how do you prefer to consume it? I like to smoke it in a joint. And then you have bongs, but bongs are really aggressive in that you're trying to take as much as you can in one hit. And bongs are good in the sense that when you smoke an bong, you get the monoterp and the sesquiterp in one little combination. But it's an aggressive hit and almost uh, uh, too rough for some people. And so what I found was that joints are optimal for me. And a lot of it is that the joint is, especially if we roll it right, where we have enough cannabis in it, 
it cools the charge down. And so as I'm smoking it, I'm not overheating my mouth. I don't feel like I'm burning my throat. Right, whereas a pipe, that, that stream it's, is just yes. directed just right through yep. the tube and depending on the length, and, and you what, know. And what we found was so many people were, were taking the butane from the lighter and they, it was becoming part of the effect. So really they were hitting butane as a drug. Or part of the harshness on your throat. Yes, and it was all combined, but they didn't realize it. And so I was always a wooden match user. I used to love wooden matches and I still do. Let's, let's, let's go through. Yeah, I yeah, want to we'll see it. exactly, uh, yeah. you know, what papers you use. Yeah. I'd like to see how you roll. Oh, totally, And yeah. then we're going to smoke it. We're going to talk gonna about how you, how you light it and the whole bit, man. Totally. So uh, let's start with, uh, yeah, what kind of papers do so you like to use? The papers I like the most are the clubs, the old Modianos. And the reason why was that when you took one of these and you lit it on fire, it literally disappeared. And so when I, if I lit this on fire. No ash. No, none. What do they call it? Light as a butterfly's wing. So... The problem with Modianos is there's no glue. And so you have to learn how to use them and they're very delicate so they rip. But what they give you is they give you the cleanest experience, but they're hard to find. I don't even know if they produce them anymore. No, yeah, you gotta find them yeah, in the secondhand market. Yep, you know, difficult to uh, dig they, up. They stop manufacturing them. Mm -hmm. It's a highly desirable consumable mm -hmm. and they're d the, the, the stockpiles are dwindling. So I brought some flour with me. That's tell us one. tell us what you brought. Let's tell see, us. we'll bring out some stuff. So I brought a stuff and it's funny, I, brought, I put it in a baggie and it was to show really that in the, in the old days, a brown bag was fine. Like we hold it in glass at the house. What matters is that we're not crushing it or damaging it or letting it overheat. I brought in some really nice stuff. My buddy Brian from, uh, what's it, Riverview Farms. He had uh, some really nice uh, Mendo breath from Gage Green Cross to a uh, Ghost OG. And so the cherry flavor in this is just deep. And the market goes after typically more of this, which is, which is an OG chem dog in terms of its visual. A little paler, a little tighter, a little more finished. And, and the point that I brought them both was is that you want to smoke this because the flavor in the mouth is incredible. Beautiful, beautiful high. Nice. I always tell people, look, we're not going to frame this and stick it up on a wall. No, okay? no. Okay? We're not going to be staring at it. I, I care about how it tastes. Mm -hmm. I care about the effects that it gives me. All right? I thought that's the bottom those, line. Those are the important parts. And I take a look and I can see that we have a beautiful resin density all throughout the entire flower and an even consistency. And as I start to break this open and get a little, I can go, oh my gosh, yeah, smell that. That's real hog's breath. And just covered in resin. Remember, it's got this great candy, yep. and, grape and, soda. And a uh, hoppy. It's got a lot of humulene in it. But as I start to handle this and feel it, I can feel that I have a, it's, it's dry. So it's going to give me a good combustion. Otherwise, what it does, it doesn't combust completely. And just if you're looking at this, it's just raining, raining resin, raining it down. So now I can start to break it up here. And as I'm doing this, I can feel the tackiness still. And what people say, like, why do you take the time to do this? And I said that a lot of the reason was that one of the beauties of smoking cannabis was that it was this private moment for yourself to be able to sit down and take a few minutes out of your work day and to build you a joint. When I, when I hung out with my, I had a bunch of Jamaican partners back like late 80, early 90, but like real Jamaican. And they would always tell me, <laughs> Jamaican. yeah, yeah, real Jamaicans. They'd be like, oh, build you a joint. And it was build you a joint and they never shared joints with each other because you should have your own joint to smoke so you didn't have to rush. I'm a firm believer of that myself me? for what it's worth. Yes, no, I do too. I would rather roll two and you have one and I have one and we can share, but the beauty in not sharing is that we don't have to rush. I can, I can smoke as much as I want. I can take a really good rich hit and all of a sudden it hits me. I can, I can contemplate like, wow, I can experience all the cannabinoid effects. And for me, that's just such a huge part of the connoisseurship. Oh, completely. It's, it's stop, so take time, enjoy the moment, mm -hmm. enjoy the ritual, enjoy the process, enjoy the aromas that are coming up as you're, as you're rolling that joint. You know, there's a lot of different um, thoughts on, on size of the joint. 
And basically, around a cigarette is good. Every now and then you'll go thicker and bigger because you're just so happy you have extra cannabis. So you're putting a little pre-fold into there. What yeah. you show? Tell us what you're doing. What I'm doing is it's just creating basically a trough so that when I hold this in my hand like this, I have something to trough it into. The trough, when you do that pre-fold, you make that trough, because I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it kind of gives a little stability to it, you know, oh, a little yeah. structural mm -hmm. stability. So when you go and you load a whole bunch of cannabis in there like you're doing right now, uh, and then you get it into that one hand, it, it's... And look it at this pile. Yeah, and look at that pile of red. Well, give them a minute to give them a minute to capture all that before oh, yeah. you look, scoop look it all that. up because it's quite impressive. Yeah, actually. you know, there's just it looks like sand on the table, you know. And and I love this. And you've already scooped up almost. Oh half yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. And but you can just see it. It just it just was falling out of this. It's all over the place. I mean, we'd scrape this whole thing up. And come up to, and I'll typically just take this right here and I'll and I'll just push this down a little bit so I can get a little little bit of density. And that just means that it tightens it up. And I'm not worried about what's falling out the end. And I can just bend this paper back like this. Give it a little lick yep. before you tear it. I just tear this shit right off. It doesn't have to be pretty. It never is. It looks rough as hell. Yep. And we just wrap it like this. And once we have this, then I can lick it. And then now the next part is leave it alone and let it dry. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about, you know, uh, about the burn test on these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're going uh, to light that baby up. Let's see. Yeah, just di like just disappears. And all I do is I get the end of it going without ever putting it in my mouth at first. This way I can get this thing cooked up a little and I might have to take one pull to pull it. It's kind of similar to the way uh, cigar connoisseurs yeah, spark theirs. Yeah, very You're similar. also not drawing any heat through. Nope, and I don't want the butane in my mouth. Or it the gas, you're not yeah. drawing any of that. Changes the whole effect of the, you, you get this really heady effect because you're gassed. And that's not what I'm looking for is to be gassed. Mm -hmm. And so once we get it here. Oh, that's beautiful. And you can see that the smoke is light. <coughs> It's so waxy, the smoke is heavier. So see how it's moving through the air and it's floating? And not really hanging in the no, air so much. No. It's, it's, it's dissipating. It's like lighter it. because we're having more of that Mexican, Colombian influence, those lighter tones, less waxy, less, uh, less heavier a smoke. This is lighter. So still good burn, clean in the mouth. Do you have any special way that you look to inhale? How do you get the most flavor? How do you taste it? I see, I see you kind of smack in your mouth a little bit as, as on the exhale there. A lot of it is like when I'm, when I'm puffing, I'm, I take a mouthful and I kind of let it out of my mouth a little bit and then I suck it in because it lets me cool the charge. Meaning that the air that I'm pulling in, so like for, for, it's, it's funny because I'm sensitive to steam. Mm -hmm. So if you watch me eat soup or spaghetti or coffee, if it's steamy, I'll gag. Yep. Gags me. And so when I'm puffing, I let it out. You almost, I saw you kind of held it in your mouth a little. Uh -huh. It's not in here. I'm, I'm pulling a vacuum. I'm holding it in my mouth. That lets me get all the oil in the mouth and I go, mmm. And then when I'm smacking it, it's because my mouth is really covered in these materials. Yeah. But it lets me now get that flavor direct with a cooler temperature. I just want to cool it down a tiny bit. And so, again, that's very similar to, to cigar smokers, except ultimately you take it into your lungs. Mm -hmm. Hey, so me thinks that hog uh, got us pretty high, huh? See, the, the hog right now, see, we're having a really nice conversation. We're oh, sitting yeah. closer no, to yeah, each it's, other. It's, it's, we're yeah, all, yeah, no, yeah, I'm yeah, over here ready to roll dice, you know? <laughs> And, and clean and just light and, and not overpowering, but you're sitting here, you know, five, seven minutes after we lit it, and you can still taste all these beautiful sweet tones, just clean, no harshness. You're like, wow, that's nice pot.
Slowing down, yeah. paying attention, yep. savoring the moment, mm -hmm. and, and, and recognizing the, the, the various characteristics and the nuance in the, in the various flowers. If the new customers that come into cannabis, the people that you want to influence correctly on how to appreciate, you know, what, what defines these things, then just say be patient. Because patience is really the key here because what it's going to allow you to do is start to educate yourself on appearance and you're going to say, this is what OG Chem should look like indoor. You know, being exposing to, yes. you know, to, to vary, don't just take that first OG, you know, no. and, and say that that's, that's the, you know, that's the quintessential version of it. Yeah. You need to see six, eight grown various different ways to truly get an appreciation. And so what you start to find out for users is, and for connoisseurship, it's really about, since we grow so many different varieties and some similar ones, you start to take a look to who's doing the job for you that you like most, because a lot of it is the visual indicator says somebody took the time. I'll tell you the visual indicator that I go for first is if you put this through any machine, done, it's B grade at best. When you're really looking at hand work, good hand work, it has a million little tiny nooks and crannies all over it, which means nobody ever sheared the flower. They followed the sh natural shape of the flower. Huge, and, when, and, and I learned that from the, the good women trimmers of Humboldt County where I don't, I don't think anybody knows more about flower. Cultivators know a tremendous amount, but I'm telling you, if you've cleaned two, 300,000 pounds in your life, you have an intimate relation. You're at nine, ten hours a day, five days a week. You've done this since you're 20, you're 50. And that's 50. where the quality comes from. I always ask the trimmers for the evaluations on, on operations, and, and then we, we, we go through them, and what was the consensus of opinion on all the factors? And they'll be like, this one stood out. And you go, whoa, I got you. To all of you that touched it, it was just all things. Yeah. Kev, you've got, you've got Port Royal. Mm -hmm. You've got Wonderland Nursery. You've got uh, you've got a dispensary that two, the, the two dispensaries. Yeah. Uh, you run the Golden Tarp competition. You got your hands full, is my point, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. What I find just so heartening uh, is the fact that you still grow six plants yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. You still have your own personal six plant garden. What exactly are you going to be growing there uh, this upcoming season? You know, I love the six plant garden. I do. It's been so many years that I got to just grow for me. You're like, for all the years you're doing your thing, you're producing cannabis, but it's not like just yours. And when you can just have your garden for your own consumption. But this year I'm gonna do a little different. This year I'm gonna put together a couple of really high THC plants so I can extract them through uh, like a sugar extraction, basically a, a glycerin. All right. And I'll be able to get high THC acid yep. for uh, tinctures. And then I'm going to do some CBD for the exact same reason, where I'll be able to pull the CBD acids out. So you're doing a medicinal garden. I'm doing year. a couple plants medicinal too, because this was the first year I've ever really. It was funny. I was going through some stress because the world is stressful, and it it, it just makes me too intense, and it wears other people out around me. And I was realizing that I was just being miserable. So I said, "Oh, I need some help, man. I need I needed I needed medicinal cannabis." So I, I uh, talked to one of my friends who makes beautiful product, the Golden Dragon guys, and, and he hooked me up with some private stock that he, you know, gift, right? Because I sell his product, but he gifted me a container that he had and said, here, uh, go on to some, a uh, little bit of tincture usage. And he said, it'll mellow you out, Kevs, because he goes, because I know you, man, you're in, the, you're in the paint. And it was such a wonderful experience to be able to use cannabis in a way that I've never used it prior. I use it topically all the time. And I, and I use it spiritually in terms of increase my quality of life. Yeah. But I never used it as this uh, very specific, I just want to take the anxiety out of my life. So just to bring it all back, yeah. back to that skunk project, yeah. uh, when, can, uh, when can people start to expect to see that out in the marketplace? Well, the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll put some of the clones out in a minute, but the seeds will be coming out this summer. So I won't be in time for the spring release, but it's okay because the, a lot of this stuff is seasonal. You know, it's, it's yeah. cannabis is year round now. So uh, I figured by summertime, I ought to have a bunch of the pollinations. I've already pulled out all the males and we labbed them all up and flowered them to see what they do. And now we're going to put them in against these, the 88, the 81 and the hog. That's so exciting. It's kind of cool. I got a cheese too out of uh, Grass Valley. Right. That is, it, it, to me, it's like when you see it grow, it is the quintessential California Christmas tree of cannabis. 
you know that old school 78 kind of looking yeah. weed? Very, very high, high apical dominance, but a beautiful Christmas tree branching and gorgeous flowers and it has a- Those root. are always big producers too. Mm -hmm. And it smells like uh, uh, camphor balls, you know, the, you used to keep the, the, the moths from eating your wool. Sure. That those, those those things it has that smell like that and in the mouth it's electric oh, it's gorgeous. You make sure I get some of those. Oh, I will, seeds, I will, please, brother. Oh, no, I'll right. put them away for sure. Uh, you got any final words today? Man, I just want to say thank you for letting me be here to uh, be a guest on the on the, the show with you because this is something I really I really like to talk about. It's cannabis connoisseurship because what I think a lot of people don't catch is that it's not about being pretentious. It's it's not about let's let's debate the fine points when we really don't understand them. It's about let's understand what we're doing so we can debate them. And it's about being patient enough to get a skill level that lets you really understand what you're looking at so that you, you spend more time enjoying and less time arguing about is it the right. And once you start to have a good feel, the decision of good is quick. It's quick, I go open the bag, I can take a look, it's gonna be good. And then we make the smoke, it is. And that confidence just grows with time, doesn't it? Oh, completely. It? And, then, and, then, and the joy of it, too, because you, you're so lucky that you get to be able to experience this. It's, back in the day, you'd only get what your dealer could give you, and it might only be a limited selection. One or selection. two strains. Bingo. Today, we are so lucky, yeah. and uh, cannabis connoisseurship it's is just uh, it's a very fun uh, hobby and pursuit. Uh, thanks for coming on today, uh, oh, right Kev. On. Uh, right on, I'm brother. looking forward to uh, trying out some more of these yeah, strains, Yeah, we're going to smoke though. some of these killers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Far out, man. Right uh, on. Hey, everybody, thanks so much for joining us on High Rollers, uh, me and Kev Jodry. Uh, until next time, I'm Derek Gilman. Look forward to seeing you. Take care. Bye. Awesome. awesome. All right, man. Uh, so what are we going to smoke next? What do you want to hit? You want to try some of that uh, uh, Blue Dream? You want, you want to go to that? Want, let's go to this house.